That's right, we're starting a new series today, 23, as we approach Easter, getting ready to celebrate that season. We're going to look at Psalm 23 over the next couple of weeks. We won't go verse by verse necessarily, but we want to see Psalm 23 as a vision of what's possible in our life with God, a vision of what life could look like if we can only aspire to the goodness that God has for us. I know for my wife, she loves Easter Sunday. That is her favorite day of the year. I think that supersedes anniversaries, it supersedes birthdays, it supersedes any other celebration. And if she had her way, we would just go crazy in this place to celebrate what God has done for us because he's, he's taken us over the line for this brand new kind of life that's available for every single one of us. But yet it's so hard sometimes to take a hold of it. So hard sometimes to see it. And we read scriptures that, that are encouraging us in the way we're meant to live. And, and, and it, it seems like I'll never take a hold of that peace that surpasses understanding. Because man, you haven't just seen the things that come against me in my life. Or you think the scripture promises, and, and it does. It says, it says we should experience God's love so completely that we no longer fear. It says perfect love, the kind of love God has for us, casts out all fear. Yet I find myself most days, certainly most weeks, falling back into a lifestyle where fear tends to creep back into my world. Or that scripture verse that says, do not worry about anything, but pray about everything. Who's living that life? Like, who's, who's really saying, I, I've taken a hold of this idea that I can I cannot worry about anything. And I'll just pray about everything. We've got two choices. We can either go, well, this, this, this kind of life that, that, that God's asking us to get to, it's just not possible. Like there's, there's no way to get there. So we're just going to kind of brush it off as a good idea, maybe a pipe dream. But we're going to step, you know, I know what God says. We're going to get into a reality that, hey, this is really the way we have to live. That's a, that's a nice idea that, that Pastor Matt or Pastor Eric can preach. But, but really, like, let's be honest. Like our life is always going to be kind of over here. Or we can lift up our eyes. Or we can consider that despite the harsh realities around us, despite the way our life has been going up to this point, that maybe the God that calls us through this word really does have a life for us that's better than anything we could have imagined so far. Maybe it's possible that despite the adversity, and the American dream kind of sometimes weaves its way into the Christian dream. I don't know if you ever noticed that or not. Sometimes the American dream weaves its way. I've seen you know, like a, a cross wrapped in an American flag, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. We have to understand that the American dream is, is, a, is a life with no adversity. The American dream is where everything I have is abundant and I've got no problems in my world. But the Christian message is not that. The Christian message is that that you will not the Christian message is not that you will not have any adversity in your life. That's not the message. And we can't start thinking that way or we're going to start we're going to start getting in this mindset that I'm talking about here. We're going to say, "Well, here what God's saying, but there's a reality I can't ignore." God's not saying that the ultimate goal of your life is to live a life without adversity in it. But I grew up in a Christian environment that kind of said, "Hey, listen, if God's blessing you, then everything's going to go right in your world." If God's blessing you, you will get that raise. If God's blessing you, you will not have any issues. If God's blessing you, you will be healthy. And they had a little time in the world where they said, hey, don't even talk about not being blessed. Don't even talk about not being healthy. Don't even confess those things. But the reality of our life, and what would happen? You'd say, oh, I'm going through some struggles. I'd say, oh, well, let's talk about that, Troy. Like, if you're having some trouble, have you, have you been praying? Have you been reading your Bible? Have you been going to church? Have you been doing all It's like this checklist of, well, if you're doing all of these things, then everything must be going right in your world. And if it's not going right in your world, well, clearly it's your fault. And so this, this, this mantle of guilt gets on our shoulders and we think, well, I guess we're just not good enough. I guess we're just not living the Christian life well enough. And I guess it's all on me. And I guess God is good, but I'm just not. And I guess I just need to get this shame on my shoulders. It's not the kind of life God's calling us to. Yet God does not give us a message without adversity. Check any 
Any, any New Testament character out. Check any Old Testament character out and tell me who it was that didn't have adversity. Check out Jonah, prophet of God, ran away from the promises and then was upset in the end. Check out Moses, who's, who's guiding these people through. He says, God, I can't even deal with these people that you've given me. Check out Elijah, who, you know, we, we read these great, we hear great messages, we read these great books about Elijah, who calls down fire on the prophets of Baal and has these great miracles happen. But at the end of his life, feels like he's the only one who's faithful. He feels completely alone and isolated in fear of his life. These great men and women of God. Look at the Apostle Paul planting churches all over the region. And all of them just about, at one point or another, disappointing him, betraying him in relationship. The Bible doesn't call us to live without adversity. Romans 8, Paul, the same one who's going through all the adversity, says, no, no, the gospel says that despite all these things, we will be more than conquerors. It's not that we don't have adversity, it's that we overcome adversity. It's not that we look for our lives to be pain-free, it's that we look above the pain to see the God who provides for us, and in that, we find an overwhelming because, you know, if you don't have that, this is what you got. You got Caleb and Lauren, who Eric mentioned, who are great people, and they are smart, and they've got great jobs, and they, they, they're all great on the outside, and everything's fine. And if they live in that other Christian world where if, they're, if they do Christian life right, they're always blessed. Like, oh, you know, hey, Caleb, how did how'd your week go? Well, it was, it, was, it was pretty good, honestly. Like, I got a raise, and the boss gave me the day off, and, you know, I came home, and and, and, and the lawn was mowed. My neighbor came over and mowed my lawn for me. And, and everything's just working out for me. My team won the Super Bowl. Like everything's just going my way. Wow. Man, Caleb, it's amazing that you have a peace that surpasses understanding. No, no. We'd all understand that peace, wouldn't we? It's amazing you live a life without fear. No, we'd all understand why Caleb is not fearing. If you went to work every day and they're like, Caleb, I, this is crazy, but the, the office called today and for the 365th day in a row, you're getting a race and they want to give you the afternoon off. Hey man, go and be blessed. If that was the kind of life that God had for every single one of us, then the scriptures would make perfect sense. But the reality is those aren't the kinds of lives God's calling us to lead. It's not the example God gives us in his word. And so we have to, listen, this is really important. We have to change our mindsets, otherwise, God's going to call us in this direction. We're going to walk in that direction thinking that, listen, we're going to think that God's a liar. We're going to think that his promises are not true. We're going to think that the way that he's calling us to go is not possible. So we've got to redirect our attention. We've got to redirect our eyes. And Psalm 23 gives us a glimpse. It starts us on that pathway to that life that he does have us. To live. So I want to, go with your, you, you, I want to go with you there today. And this is what we want you to do. Over the next couple of weeks, we won't always reference Psalm 23 directly, but we want you to take a hold of this kind of a life so that, so that you can find this rich and satisfying life God has planned for every single one of us. You know, my son and I, Cooper, he's 16, and when they're 16, when they're 13, when they hit that teenage years, and they're, especially boys, I can't speak for girls because I don't have any of those, but, but you just try to find opportunities to connect. You find anything they want to do together is like a win because most of the time they want to have their independence. So anything they want to do with you is fantastic. And my son, Cooper, wanted to watch this show called Bondi Rescue. And it's a, it's a reality TV show about uh, lifeguards in Australia. And it's not a fantastic show, so I'm not recommending it to anyone in the audience. But I want to explain to you kind of what I learned watching that show. And one of the things I learned was that when you're a lifeguard and, and uh, you're going to rescue a drowning victim, you have to have a lot of training. You can't just go out and do that on your first day. And, and if you Google how to rescue a drowning person, they will not say dive into the water and rescue them. They will say that's the wrong thing to do. Do not get in the water with a drowning victim. Why? Because when you swim up to them, they're drowning. They're panicked. And what they will do is they will grab a hold of you and push you down so that they can get up. And usually what happens in situations like that, when someone goes in, man, all great intention, they go out and they swim out to try to rescue someone who's drowning, usually both people end up underwater. 
a lot of times both lives are lost because the drowning victim, despite themselves, pushes the other person underwater. We want to equip you today and through this series as you're swimming through your life, as, as, you're, as you're walking through. Lifeguards are meant to take someone's life and redeem it again. Someone who's, who's losing their life to rescue them out of that water. But the, but the advice is not jump in the water. The advice is stand on the shore and offer some hope. So I know as you're navigating your life, you're going to see your finances sinking. You're going to see your, your health at some point in your world sinking. You might see relationships that are valuable to you sinking. You're going to see areas of your world that are important to you sinking as you go through your life. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but at some point. We're all going to have areas that are sinking. And what we have to learn to do is not to jump in the water with those issues and allow our finances to get a hold of us. And, and breathe that anxiety that rises up on the inside of us. But instead, we need to learn how to get a hold of our finances. Standing on biblical ground. Standing on holy ground. When our relationships get rocky, we have to be careful not to jump in and grab our relationships because they can pull us under. But instead, we stand on solid ground and we reach out to our relationships from that biblical viewpoint so that we can rescue our relationships and stay above the water ourselves. Listen, you know, you know it's true. Have you ever gotten, you ever gone to the doctor and said, we need to run a test because this could be something serious? And you'll get the test results in about five days? The time between that appointment and that five days? If you never felt like circumstances in your life could get you drowning, you'll learn real quick what it's like to dive into the water with your issues. If you're not standing on solid footing, and listen, at that point, you don't need to do life alone. At that point, you need to have people around you, reminding you, holding you back from jumping into that water because the first thing you want to do is dive in and grab that problem and worry and worry and worry and worry. The Bible says you're not going to add anything to your life worrying, but yet it's just a natural reaction. We want to help you lift up your eyes to see the light that God has for you because in the moment, in the adversity, it seems impossible it doesn't even like, seem like something we'd aspire to. But there's a real life that exists on the other side because God is always faithful. Despite all these things, we are more than overcomers. So let's take a look real quickly at Psalm 23. Let's take a look at this light that we're putting on the, on the big screen for you, this light that we believe is waiting for you on the other side of the obedience of the life God's calling you to live. Let's look at it together. Psalm 23, I'm going to read the whole thing starting in verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. We're starting off good. I lack nothing. That's a, good, that's a good promise. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Check. I like that. He leads me beside quiet waters. If you know me, I love quiet. Check. I'm in. He refreshes my soul. And everyone said, amen. amen. He guides me along right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint with head, my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Man, that scripture, Psalm 23, it's like a big hug in our worlds when we get there. But the reality is, on our Tuesdays and our Wednesdays, so often we're not living there. In our life, we've, we, we've gone away from the Word of God and we've dove in with our issues and they're pulling us away from the promises. The issues of our real, everyday lives are pulling us away from the promises of God. And we have to learn how to get back to that place. And if we want to get to that place, we have to change the way we're thinking, like Pastor Eric said. One of my favorite authors, A.W. Tozer, one of my favorite Christian thinkers, he's got this quote, and it's fantastic. I've, I've mentioned it to you before. He says, what comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And here's the reality. Psalm 23 starts off, the Lord is my shepherd. That means the one who's guiding me, the one who's got my pathway, the one who's got that rod and that staff, if a wolf comes, they can take them down. If I'm going down into the valley where there's no water, there's no food, he can redirect my eyes back to that 
green pasture, back to those still waters where I can find refreshment and safety and comfort and joy. But I have to think about my shepherd. See, because if I think that my shepherd isn't loving towards me, if I think my shepherd doesn't want that for me, and there's lots of people, I don't know if that's you today, there's lots of people that feel like God is not for me. God is not paying attention to me. God is not listening to my prayers. God is not interested in my world. There's a whole group of people, the majority of the world would feel that way. But if we want to trust the Lord as our shepherd, the way we have to think about God, the way his word tells us he thinks about us, is that he loves us as the greatest father has ever loved the greatest child. If we don't believe that today, we have to change the way that we think. We also have to believe if he's gonna be an effective shepherd in our lives, because it's easy to say the Lord is my shepherd, but to really embrace it, we have to believe not only that he loves us and that he cares for us, but also that he's able to help us. He has to love us, care for us, and also be able because you see, when that health report happens and someone says, I'm going to pray for you, you're like, I can't pray right now. I've got other things going on. I don't, I can't, God can't help me with this situation. I need real answers here. The moment we think that going to God is not a real answer in our world, we may believe that he loves us all day long, but we don't believe he's able to provide all that we need. If we want to get to this Psalm 23 life, we have to believe that he's able to provide all these things in our world. What else do we have to believe? We have to believe that he's willing. The most important thing about you is what comes to mind when you think about God. If you don't think he's able, if you don't think he's willing, if you don't think he loves you, then we're gonna miss out on the most important pathway we have to walk. But if the default is, he loves me. If the default is, he's able. If the default is, he's willing. Then when we hit that adversity moment, we'll lift our eyes back up to that Psalm 23 life and we'll find the pathway home. That Psalm 23 scripture, it's like a warm hug. You know, and, and my wife, I don't know if I've ever told you this before, but I know I've mentioned it in, in passing in, in messages before. My wife makes the best chocolate chip cookies you will ever have. My wife makes amazing chocolate chip cookies. There's nothing that says comfort, Jen. Nothing that says comfort, John, like a good chocolate chip cookie. Yeah. I mean, if that thing comes out of the oven and it, it's just got that, that bubbliness kind of, you can see it sizzling, Joe, still on the surface, like a good pizza. I could speak to the Merits and, 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 and the Malulis about a good, so if you want to know where to get great pizza, talk to the Merits and talk to the Malulis. They'll tell you where to get the best slice of pizza in Atlanta. They are, they are pros, but I'm talking about chocolate chip cookies. And they're just out of the oven. They've got that little sizzle still on top. And you've got that glass of whole milk. You can't have skim milk because that's of the devil. You have to pull all the fat. All the fat comes over when you want comfort. All the fat over to the side. And it's just like you're not taking your eyes off this. You've got the smell. And you can get that cookie. It's just the right temperature into that. And it's like the milk not only cools it, but it loosens it up. So when it hits your mouth, that cookie just falls apart in your mouth. And I don't know what David was thinking when he wrote Psalm 23. And I don't know if David ever had a chocolate chip cookie, but I'm telling you, I know it's not the most spiritual example in the world, but you can relate. It falls apart and you're like, man, this is just comfort and this is home. This is beautiful. And my wife makes the best ones. Let me just tell you something. I do not. I don't make the best chocolate chip cookies. Now I watch her. And if you come to my house and, and she wants to make them, sometimes she'll make them right there and she'll pull out the, the mixer and rah, 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 rah. she doesn't do the slice and bakes or the dice and bakes or the break and bakes or any of that. There's no shortcuts to this thing. You got to get the flour, you got to get the sugar, you got to get the eggs, you got to get the vanilla, you got to get all that, and you got to get the mixer and mix it all together, and then you got to suck it in the oven. But you might see her making it and you might think, oh, I, I can do that. I've got that going on. And Kim goes home and says, Joe, did you like those chocolate chip cookies? I did. Well, I, I saw Sunny making them. I was paying attention. And she, 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 she used flour, and she used brown sugar, and she used eggs, and she used vanilla extract. So Joe, good news. I know you love that pizza. I'm about to make you some of the best chocolate chip cookies you've ever had. Here, first we're going to start with a spoonful of flour, Joe. I saw Sonny making them. Here, I'm going to crack this egg. Open up. 
because it's flour and eggs and sugar and vanilla. It, it, see, it's a whole different thing. Works the same way with the promises of God. It's one thing to have a great chocolate chip cookie and just enjoy that thing. It's a whole other thing to hear about how it's made and grab a, a big spoonful of flour to start your experience and just take a big gulp. Because you see, the ingredients might be the same, but you haven't let it bake in your world. And if you haven't let it bake in your world just yet, you'll miss the beautiful meaning of what it means to have that beautiful promise that's coming out of that oven. And it, 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 it's all the difference. Let's be honest. Like, we, we all know people, and maybe, that's, maybe this is you today. You go, well, I, I know that the Bible's a good book, but I don't want to read it because it's just too dry for me. You're just, listen, I promise you, you're, you're just taking that flour and putting it in your mouth, and you're missing the cookie. We all carry Bibles. We didn't give you ones like this, but we all carry Bibles with leather outsides when I was growing up, and the gold, you know, pages. You know, the gold's not on the outside of the pages. The gold is inside on the pages. And we got to start looking good with our Bibles and looking good with the Word of God on the inside of us because it makes all the difference. And Jesus tells us about this. See, Jesus points the way to Psalm 23. He, he, he gives us a picture of what this life looks like and how to get there. And he does it through Psalm 22, which is awesome. And there's this, there's this um, famous scripture that when Jesus was hanging on the cross, he's, he's, he's getting ready to open the doorway to this beautiful redeemed life for every single one of us. All the promises are about to be yes and amen. All spiritual blessings in heaven are about to be ours. But he's got to first go through this experience. And as he's on the cross, the gospels tell us, he utters these words. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in an uneducated reading of Scripture, and with new eyes, we read that and we think it's like that, it's like that flower in our mouths, like he's on the cross and he's crying out to God who's not listening, and we can relate to that experience. And it's like that dry flower. We knew it. We, we've been in the same experience. We felt like God should be there for us, and he wasn't there for us. But Jesus, he's just so good. Jesus always knows what he's doing. And for him, Scripture is like a symphony. All of the parts working together. He's seen the genesis of the whole heavens and the whole earth. He's watched the Israelites in Exodus into the promised land. He's seen how good it is. He, he knows the potential. And he's, he's, he's read the prophets and he sees the world right now. He's ready to take them on a new Exodus. And he says, but I know what you're going to go through. I know what your life is going to look like because I'm living one just like that, but I want to get you to Psalm 23. I want to lead you beside those still waters because I am the good shepherd. I want to lead you into that life that's promised in so many sermons but, but lacks so much in our reality of our everyday worlds. And so he cries out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he's not just telling us about his experience. He's pointing us back to scripture. He's opening up the doors. For someone who hasn't read the Bible, they go, oh, that's, man, he's really suffering. That's a shame, and that's true. But for everyone in earshot of that cross, for Mary, for John, they knew immediately, wait a minute, Jesus isn't just crying out. Jesus is quoting Psalm 22. Because you see, for Jesus, Scripture wasn't just like he had memorized six and he had one ready for suffering. You see, he understood all of Scripture and he saw this Scripture that, that King David wrote out about himself as also referencing Jesus' journey. If you read through all of Psalm 22, you'll see it. And he said, I know these people that are watching, I know these people are going to hear about this experience I'm having, and they're all going to go through adversity of their own. And as I'm in my moments, a moment of greatest adversity, I want to point them as well to this rich and satisfying life. I want to give them the pathway to get to this life that God has for them. And so he cries out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in doing so, he gives us the keys to overcome adversity in our life. If we'll just take a hold of it and unlock the door, 
So listen, today, if your experience of the Christian life is like that dry spoonful of flour when you were expecting a chocolate chip cookie, or John, if it's like taking that vial of vanilla extract and chugging it and going, it's not the same as what Sonny made. Brittany, this isn't as good. It's true. The Christian life you're experiencing may not be all that it's cracked up to be, but the promises are still possible. The life is still available for you and for me. So let's look at Psalm 22 together. I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's really long. But you can read it at home. I'll take you through the beginning, the middle, and the end and show you the progression of thought that goes through Psalm 22 because in Jesus' greatest moment of adversity in his life, he cried out these words, pointing as a signpost to this passage. Look at it with me. Psalm 22, starting in verse 1. You'll recognize it. It says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish. Who's ever thought that between the doctor's uh, report and the receipt of the, 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 the results? Who's ever thought that when they looked at their finances and everything seemed to be going wrong? Who's ever thought that when their relationships had gone bad? Who's ever thought of that when they were in the midst of the adversity they were facing in their lives? My God and my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Now let's look at verse three. He spends two verses saying, God, where are you? I can't find you. God, I'm in adversity. God, I'm in trouble. God, I'm suffering. God, I'm panicking. You say, don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. I'm praying, I'm not seeing any answers here. God, what do I do? And remember, it's not just me. Jesus on the cross points us to this place. We've gotta get through Psalm 22 so we can experience Psalm 23. Verse one, anguish. Verse two, anguish. Verse three, he changes his mind. We've got to change our minds this morning. Verse three, he changes his mind. Yet, refocus. Trouble, 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 trouble. Yet, you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you, our ancestors put their trust. They trusted in you and you delivered them. To you, they cried out and were saved. In you, they trusted and were not put to shame. Jesus is telling us, lift up your eyes. When it seems like God is not faithful, remember his faithfulness. Don't just pull out Jeremiah 29, 11 every time. Don't just say, hey, I know the, the plans the Lord has for you to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you hope in the future, and stand on that only. Because that's like taking a dry cup of flour. When Lisa Cockerham is going through crisis, and she comes to you and she's upset and you say, well, the Lord has plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you hope in the future. So you, you just go with that. And you walk away. It's like you just cracked an egg in her mouth and called it a chocolate chip cookie. That didn't do anything for her except heap that mantle of shame upon her neck that she, as a Christian, shouldn't be feeling adversity. She shouldn't be feeling any kind of adversity. She shouldn't be feeling any kind of shame, any kind of lack, any kind of, you know, the first connect group I ever went to. Sanjay, you can take a, take a note from this. Young Adults Connect Group at the University of Georgia. I went to my first Connect Group. I had just gotten saved. I didn't have any friends, any connections. I walked in the door, and we had a great little connection. It was, it was guys and girls together, and then they, then they split apart, and they went into two different rooms, and they had prayer time. It was just me and two other guys. So it was like the group leader, the assistant group leader, and the newly saved guy. <laughs> And so they were like, well, we're going to pray. And I'm like, oh, I don't, don't know exactly how that works, but let's do it. Okay, I'm in. Let's pray. And he said, okay, well, before we do that, we're going to go around the room. Is there anything we need to pray for? And I said, well, sure. Absolutely. Man, I'm, I'm, I'm about to go back to Atlanta, and I'm about to um, start a new job and, and leave all these relationships I have in Athens, and I'm, I'm worried. Like, I'm just, I'm scared of what the future looks like. So if you guys could just pray for me. And the assistant lead, group leader says, well, Worrying's a sin. So you need to stop that right now. Thought, well, that's super comforting, bruh. <laughs> My fist really wants to talk to your face. <laughs> but I'm a, I'm a Christian now, so I'm just going to sit here and smile. Because you see, those platitudes don't work in, in one moment. It's like, getting, it's like getting a face full of flour, and it's dry and it's weary. So God says, listen, when you face adversity, he says, you've got to remember the faithfulness of the Father. 
So instead of saying it's a sin to worry, you say, but listen, bro, do you know how faithful God is? In this new season, see, in this church, we speak life like Pastor Eric did in this, in this uh, beginning of this service. Hey, do you remember how faithful God is? Do you remember what he did with the Israelites? Do you remember how he delivered his people? Do you remember what he did in your past? Do you remember all these beautiful things that God has done? And then Psalm 22, 23, as he's going through the scripture, he says, you who fear the Lord, praise him, all you descendants of Jacob. Honor him, revere him, all you descendants of Israel. So he says, I know you're worried, verses one and two. He says, but remember God's faithfulness, verse three through five. And then we skip all the way to 23 because he's going through all the things that are happening to him. If you want to relate to some suffering, check that out. To be reminded of Jesus on the cross. He says, yet, just like Pastor Eric said in Habakkuk, yes, but I will choose to praise him. You want to find your way from adversity into the promised land, from lack to rivers of living water, to green pastures, to gentleness and peace and quiet and tranquilness and the blessing of God. He says, acknowledge your adversity, then remember his faithfulness, and then begin to praise his name. Begin to cry out to him. Verse 31, this is the very end of Psalm 22. He says, then they will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. Now listen to this, all right? I'm not just telling you what Jeff thinks. I'm not telling you good ideas. I'm giving you God ideas, all right? So Jesus on the cross utters, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Beginning of Psalm 22, the last words Jesus utters on the cross, it is finished. The last words of Psalm 22, he has done it. You may experience adversity, but if you'll remember his faithfulness and praise him in that moment, you'll wind up with a testimony. Do you hear what I'm saying? Listen, this is the key. This is the gateway to Psalm 23. The next verse is Psalm 23, 1. The Lord is my shepherd. You want to get to the Lord as your shepherd, this is how you get there. You go through adversity, you remember his faithfulness, you praise his name, and you'll wind up with a testimony. God wants to get you to that chocolate chip cookie moment. God wants to take you through the whole process. But listen, he's, you got to bake it just a bit. you got to get this word in your world when everything is good because when, when adversity comes, you got to get Chris Patterson come up to play some keys into your world. you got to get some worship. Even when you don't feel like worshiping, you need Corey to say, everybody, raise your hands. And you go, you haven't seen my week. I don't need to see your week. I know who your shepherd is. But you don't understand, you don't understand where I've been. Doesn't matter where you've been. I know who's leading you. But you don't understand what I've done. Doesn't matter what you've done. I know who's redirecting your eyes with that rod and that staff. Listen, I, I believe for every single person sitting in this room, sometimes, some days, you just get mouths full of flour. It's just the human experience. But it's only the first two verses of Psalm 22. It bakes when we start remembering his faithfulness. It bakes when despite our circumstances, we pick up his word every morning and we expect in that experience to receive something from him. It bakes in our world when we get into a connect group. Oh, here he goes again with connect groups. He just wants me to join another one of their ministries so we can help their church grow. Our mission statement is not inviting everyone or influence so we can fill more seats, get more finances, and build bigger buildings. It's not our mission statement. And listen, it's not our heart. And listen, I don't care what you say, I don't care what you've heard. It's not who we are. Our only heart here to see everyone experience the fullness of life that God has for them. So why do we invite you? Why do we invite you to a connect group? We invite you to a connect group because you're going to have dry flower days. You're going to have vanilla extract experiences. And if you don't, if you want to know what that's like, I told John, I don't know if you should swallow this when you do this, but if you want to go home, put a tablespoon of vanilla extract in your mouth and compare that to a chocolate chip cookie, you'll, you'll feel what I'm, what I'm, what I'm saying. Come on, Terrence, you just let me know next week how that works out. But isn't that the truth? 
of how we experience our Christian life sometimes. The Bible never says that's an invalid experience. It just lifts our eyes from there to the reality of the world that we're in. And it works. But we have to understand who our shepherd is. And we have to change our minds. The most important thing about us is what comes into our minds when we think about God. Why? Because we have to believe that he's faithful. We have to believe that he's able. We have to believe that he's willing. We have to believe that he loves us. Otherwise, thinking about God doesn't change anything. You miss one of those things, it doesn't matter. And when you're in adversity, you don't have time to learn anymore. You've got to have it already fully baked or surround yourself with others who do. It's not enough just to get, okay, serve on a team. Because you see, when you serve on a team, you're serving with people who believe the same things we're talking about. And you may not have connect group till Wednesday, but if you serve on a team and Sunday morning in the parking lot, you can hang out with Jermaine and Alan and get encouraged. You can go back in kids and hang out with big Ben's of Lesky and go, I don't know if God's big enough. He goes, God is big enough. <laughs> get people around your worried world like Rick Overton, who, who doesn't speak a lot in church, but when he does speak, man, you need to listen because that guy's got some wisdom on the inside of him. You know what happens when a five-year-old falls to the ground? Stubs his knee, it's bleeding, comes in, mom, mom, I just, I remember the other guy. Try to get him on anything else. Well, honey, let me see. I can't, no, I can't show you my knee, my knee is hurt, it's so bad. Well, I want to help you. I can't let you help me, I don't want any help. People come into church all the time. Ask my wife. Sometimes when I've got struggles, when I've got issues, I've got anxieties, I'm grab. So he's like, let me just help you. Let me just pray. I don't want to, I don't want to. You don't understand what's going on. You don't see what's happening. You don't understand the hurt. Kids, they don't want you to touch their knee. They don't want you to spray that back teen devil spray on there. They don't want you to help. But you say, Johnny. <laughs> Got some chocolate chip cookies in the oven. You want one? They're like, Wah. You chip cookies? You got chocolate chip cookies? Hi. Right. Yeah, let's do that. And they forget all about their knee. You're not, you're not that different. I'm not that different. But you don't understand. I'm going through so much pain. I'm going through so much hurt. Psalm 23, life is available for you. But what do you think about it? Is it like, ah, just some slice and bakes? No, no, no. It's in a slice and bake life. This is fully baked, fully risen, sizzling out of the oven, ready for that whole milk. That whole milk will not overcome. Okay, in their mouth, beautiful. It's comfort, it's home. It's like your soul meets its moment. God wants to meet you right in your adversity. He wants to meet you right in your moment to bring you into the fullness of life that he has for you. But we've got to. We've got to change the way that we think about him so that when adversity comes, we're ready to roll. So when adversity comes, we already smell the baking. We already know how good he is. And we've got people all around us who can do exactly the same. Before I finish, I just want to read to you real quickly out of Psalm 24. So I read to you Psalm 22, Jesus is going to the cross. It's not just about Jesus. Really, he's mentioning a scripture that David wrote and it applies to every single one of us, that suffering and that loneliness. He guides us through that place. And just like Psalm 22, Psalm 23 doesn't just describe what someone can experience in God, it describes what we all can experience in God. And then Psalm 24, let me read to you verse one. It says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, for he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Verse seven, 
So lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Verse 10, who is he? This King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. When he goes through his suffering moment and he winds up in the beautiful streams and the beautiful fields of Psalm 23, he again goes back to praise. He again goes back to acknowledgement. He again goes back to reminding himself of who his shepherd is because the adversity will come again. Psalm 23 says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. We'll never escape the adversity. You'll never escape anxiety like that but you can invite the Lord in to prepare a table before you in their presence. Your cup can overflow in spite of the anxiety, in spite of the oppression, in spite of the enemies. And you can find a life that's greater than anything you could ever imagine. It is possible, not just for me, not just for John and Marla, not just for Dave and Annie. It's possible for you. That's why we're here. So lift up your eyes today and let's change the way we think so that every one of us can experience the goodness and the fullness of Psalm 23 this Easter season. Come on, let's pray together.